So that's the eye. And you're looking at a, a group of different indicators to actually uh, assess the quality uh, of any given species. For me, I'm always testing texture. You get used to what a fish should feel like and how hard the meat should feel. Um, it should be really springy, quite dense um, for most species. Um, but yeah, case by case. Um, gills are another good, good sign. Good, light coloured, light pink gill. No odour or almost zero odour. Especially you want to melt uh, very quickly. Alright, so... I even like mullet. I like enjoying mullet sashimi uh, or ceviche. Um, kingfish works really well, mackerel, there's a heap of varieties that do work. There are some that just fail every time, like I said, like I said before, they just become like chewing gum in your mouth and you never get to the end of um, the sinew or the um, firmer texture. Um, yeah, so long as the fish is fresh, and freshness is definitely key with sashimi, or it's been handled particularly well. Um, you can have a fish, and there's that guy down in Sydney now, Josh Nylon, and he's selling fish after three weeks. So he's dry, drying the fish, uh, like dry aged meat. He's never allowing the fish to touch water, cutting the scales off with a knife, hanging them in his cauldron for up to three weeks at a time. So fish like albacore, um, fish with high fat content seem to work much better than others. Uh, but even things like coral trout, he'll let them hang for a couple of weeks before he sells them in his restaurant um, or in his uh, fish butchery. Um, he's called Josh Nylon. Um, his shop's called Fish Butchery. And his restaurant's called St. Peter's uh, Paddington. Uh, an absolute revelation to the industry in the way that uh, fish is appreciated and the different handling techniques to bring out different flavours. All right, so we've got a lovely um, long... You see the colour of of that flesh. Um, a little bit of age, and you give this a couple of days more, left it just in the fridge, you know, one degree, and you seem to develop a lot more colour and a lot darker. It doesn't look as bright. You see a fillet like that, it just looks really palatable. Um, you know that it's in really good quality. So you can imagine on a fish fillet, right at the thickest part at the shoulder there, you've got a certain amount of sinew. As you work your way down towards the tail, that, that banding of sinew is the same. So it gets chewier and chewier as you work your way along. Then a nice big slab of tuna, not so much for salmon, it's pretty even in its texture, but you get a nice big slab of tuna. This part here, I'd almost never work um, with raw sashimi. Um, for me, I normally end up taking that home and chopping it up a million times with a knife, breaking down those sinews as much as I can, and then I'll make a, I'll add like horseradish cream and different bits of flavourings to it and just eat that as a ceviche. But generally for sashimi, really nice, even clean cuts. You're working through this part here. Uh, you get that much more open texture uh, and a, generally a, a better... Here's a little rundown. Um, butterflying a fish isn't scary. It's the same thing as doing a, um, a normal fillet. You're working from the inside of the fish there. I've already gutted this guy just to make it a little bit easier for everyone. So all you need to do, run your knife in through the gut, over the, um, the baseline there, all the way to the spine. This is where you need to open your fish up and you're cutting straight through the rib cage, using that spine line that's through the center there, just as a guide, popping all those Rib cage bones there, all the way through to the head. Uh, once again, all those short cuts, keep your tracing down, all the way down until you actually see your start, your knife will start edging up against the, you'll see it, actually see the edge of the knife running along the top there. So you know you've got all the way to the end. So you've cleared one side, just like that. And then just repeat the process. 
straight over through the rib cage using the spine as a trace. You can hear all those lovely pops. That's what you're looking for. Some resistance there, depending on the size of the fish. As they get larger, like if you're cutting a 15, 20 kilo reef guide, the bones obviously get a lot larger, so you need to be applying a little bit more force. It becomes really important then to keep your hands out of the way, that much force in a mistake, and uh, it gets messy pretty quick. All right, so now we have basically two fillets. The spine is still in the center there. Uh, all we need to do is separate you can do it, just tease that away. Get back down to the keel. With a nice snap, we can cut if you like. Snap that away. And literally tear it out. Hook its head there. That's it. Um, a little bit of cage work, so normally when I'm filleting fish I roll over the cage so I remove this process, I don't have to do it. Uh, but all you have to think about is when you're cutting the rib cage out is you're trying to mimic the shape of the cage that you're trying to cut out. So with this, it comes in on a curved shape there, you get your knife underneath these pins and you're just trying to roll your hand underneath. That's it. And the other side as well. This gets awkward. Uh, the, uh, you're cutting back towards yourself. You're still trying to mimic that shape, but it never, like, I've been doing this for a little while now, it never feels normal um, cutting back this way towards yourself. So just take time with it, be a little bit careful. That's it. So, remaining left to do then is just the pin bone through the center here. Uh, that as well, um, a lot of the time when you're working with salmon, you pin binds as you're pulling out the snap. Uh, it's still, to me, unacceptable to allow that to remain in the fillet. Um, you're gonna serve that in a restaurant. It's a big no-no. Um, you gotta keep an eye on your pins as you're pulling them, you know, definitely. So a whole fish this size, would cost about nine dollars. It's something you'd too commonly see on, on a menu anyway. But yeah, what a, what a great way to see a fish. Uh, it's all about keeping busy. Uh, I always work with a good amount of control over the head area there. Um, just allows you to lever up your fish and create that roll of rotation. You can put your knife down onto the spine line in the way that you want. Um, so the first cut is always in just behind the pectoral fin and a flick out cutting right back up into the shoulder. There's a huge amount of meat there. If you cut straight down, you're gonna lose a good percentage of the, of the meat that's there. The meat off the shoulder is the thickest. It's also gonna cook the, um, the most juicy when you go to cook it because that, that thickness is there. So with your knife running all the way along that radial line of bones, and what you're trying to do is uh, have a look at the dorsal fin at the top there and you're actually trying to keep the edge of your knife only really short in the fish and slide down all the way, and you want to keep it as close to that top fin as you can. Running it all the way down to get down to the keel. Slide your knife in and across to the other side. And now we can start having a look inside the fish and seeing how we've gone there. What you want to see is just radial bone running from the spine line. And all you need to do now, you see how little work I'm doing, I'm just teasing uh, the meat away there from the, um, from the bone. Once you've got it fully cleared through up to the spine line, a little bit beyond that, I've actually rolled my knife over the top of the rib cage. It's just a slide. You're literally just sliding down the other side. In this fashion, I don't have to do any cage work because I've actually rolled the knife over the top of the cage. A lot of people will get in there and straight cut. Realize when you're working with a, a fish with a good spine line, if you straight cut, you're going to be losing a mill or so of meat underneath the side of the, of the knife there as you're running along the spine. So doing that short cut-in method, tracing back to the spine and then a little roll over the top to clear off that fillet gives you the best recovery. With expensive fish like this and with any fish really, um, it's all about getting the best recovery that you can. Uh, cutting from the other side, a lot of people hate it, um, but it's no different. 
Um, that I actually think it's a little bit easier because your fish is going to sit a little bit more flat, be a little bit more stable. Uh, once again, up into the shoulder, all the way through, and a flick away, tracing, and you're just looking to see where the edge of your knife is emerging from the fillet or the, the fish there to create your fillet, and you want it as close to the edge of the fins as you can. Across the keel and away we go again. Tracing back, and it's all about looking, so you're just having a look and just letting the knife do the work. It sounds funny, but um, the, with a fish like this, even as tightly bound in rigor that it is, there's very little resistance to um, the knife as it's coming through there. Once again, a little slide all the way up, keeping the knife short. It's all about looking, seeing how you're going all the way down to the ribcage, rolling over the top of that ribcage. We've got um, two fillets there, both skin on, scale on. So we'll skin it. So, uh, I mean, Moses, it's, um, it's a labor of love sort of a fish. Um, So you're only getting a small amount of weight return per fish, so you've got to keep your hands busy the whole time. It's about understanding your own body mechanics to figure out, because everyone's got a different filleting technique, the fastest way through the fish with the best recovery. And this is in the same family as Red Emperor, and you see it's a very similar flesh and um, very similar flavour to Red Emperor, that Luchinus family, whereas the, the jobfish, the gold band, part of the Priscilla Malloy family, so it's just a different family set. Uh, yeah, it's just constant movement and like, you get a bin of these, it definitely takes an hour to fill it, skin and bind them, uh, but it's well worth it for your own um, practice for one. Uh, but the mar margin, you'll make more money on this fish than any other fish. Uh, it comes down to understanding that it's out there and available. Uh, as regularly as what it is, and yeah, away you go. If I saw this on a menu, I'd be like, "Our record is done." Finding that line to run the knife around the ribcage. Yeah. Yes, it's practice. Yeah, it's just practice. Yeah. That's it. Uh, now skinning. Um, it's just. It's just. Very easy. Oh. Uh, normally, never so bother to. Um, pin my knees unless you're using them for sashimi or and you want to preserve that whole look of the fillet, you'd spend an hour pin lining them. Um, you know, after an hour of filleting. It's really important as well, like every minute fish is out of the fridge is getting hot. Um, so you don't want to spend too much time mucking around, smash it through, get it done, move on to the next thing. Um, for me in retail it's about getting them onto the counter and uh, making the money for you guys and the kitchen will be getting out to the pans. Um, in cooking. I'm going to use the leather jacket. Um, yeah, a sardine fillet, that and a, like we were just talking before, that and a salsa verde served very simply with maybe some roast potatoes. Uh, really classy dish. Flesh themselves, like the, the fillets cost you just about nothing. 
uh, if I saw it on the menu, I wouldn't mind why I'm just going to order it. Um, you can make fish sauce uh, from the, from the resist, like resolving frames when you finish your fillet. Um, yeah, really outstanding fish. And top 10 most nutrient dense foods on the planet. Uh, just uneatable. Uh, and that's another thing um, <coughs> whiting, gar, any of those smaller estuarine micro initial species, you don't need to bone them out. Frying them hot enough with direct heat and the bones melt and become edible. I've never boned out a piece of a whiting for a deep fry. Cooking at 180, like deep frying, they're just, they're gone. Yeah. You've got to be proactive about finding the right solutions if you want to work with seafood regularly. Finding the right suppliers uh, and asking questions. Because a lot of the time, wholesalers get stuck with fish that generally the industry doesn't want, um, but are worth uh, much more value than um, what's normally um, ascribed to them. By too much force as you're sliding through because the, the bone that's the spine there is actually that fine anyway. And that little edge cut there, it's just a little bit of a, you don't want to press too hard because you'll flatten the fillet and you'll apply too much heat. That's it. In, just slide. Yeah, beautiful. Look how lovely that looks. Crisp. Yeah. Um, yep, yeah. so mint and oregano, heaps of salt, sea salt into a pot, plenty of water enough to cover them, and boil that down and make the best fish sauce better. Mm. Keeping your hands out of the way at all times, especially with knives this sharp, um, you know, it's just common sense. Like um, breaking any, anything down. Um, you will learn that. Um, that's one fillet. So a little bit of cage work there, just getting underneath the cage, and you're just sliding your knife under. There's a couple of bones in the fillet here, just at the edge, just to work away with. I normally tidy up this trim here as well. It just presents better on the plate. This last little section of extended part of the tail through to the keel there, I'll normally take that off as well, just to make the fillets a little bit more tidy for sale and retail. Uh, and on the plate as well, that part will overcook generally by the time that this top section's cooked. Uh, so you want that consistency over the whole fillet. Generally fish don't taste any different from front to back. When you're dealing with reef fish, uh, in a lot of the inshore species, Probably the estuarine species as well. Uh, there are exceptions for that. You've got um, other pelagic fish, tuna, marlin, um, swordfish, moonfish. Moonfish can have like eight or nine different cuts of meat that comes off the same dish. Tuna, obviously, you've got that chitoro, uh, toro, and um, akami. Um, so you've got those three different grades of, of meat that comes off the same dish. So I think you're probably going to see. The Nicolosa family um, before anywhere, so the easiest way to understand why I like it so much is just to cook it. And um, we'll fry a little bit of this now and get that started onto the pan. So this is leather jacket. Yeah. Oysters are farmed at the mouths of rivers, so you get a good mixture of fresh water and salt water, which tangibly alters the flavour. It's more just more minerality to it. Um, it can be too strong for some. Um, generally, that's why I think the South Australian oysters have just dominated the market in the last 10, 15 years, uh, with Coffin Bay being at the, the forefront of that. Um, definitely. Um, it's getting that popular that Coffin Bay ends up as a finishing area, where people will raise these up to a smaller size, get them around to Coffin Bay, and actually just finish them off there, and they'll spend a year or two in the water there. Yeah. Because it's worth so much more money, it's so much easier to sell an oyster from South Australia. Um, having a mixture of fresh water and salt water can be quite dangerous. Every time it rains, you get that massive flood of water dropped out over all the oyster beds. If you're farming an oyster at the mouth of a river, you're exposed to a lot more risk with bacteria and sediment, mm. all sorts of things. Mm. So generally, they've been tested by the CSIRO after a big downpour and ascertain whether they're safe to send to market. The part that's holding it close, the adductor, is just always here on the right hand side of the bead. It's always in the same spot. It doesn't matter which species of oyster you're opening in Australia, and there's quite a few. Uh, it's always at that spot there. So I'm looking just to slide the edge of my knife over the top of that adductor muscle. 
Work my way down to the hinge and just fold my knife back towards me and use that fulcrum point there to release it. You can see there where it was attached, that part there. That's what I was looking to prise away from that base part of the meat. Uh, it's still attached to the underside of the shell there. So you just need to tease or slide down the knife on the face of the shell itself to release it. Once you've released it, sometimes it creates a little suction point here, which you may need to release as well. But just turn it over. An oyster generally looks better on the second side. Um, you get that wonderful uh, convex shape of that meat, which mimics the underside of that shell uh, and presents better to the clientele or this uh, customer. You can see the first side, what that looks like. Pretty rough. Second flip side. Over, so it looks uh, yeah, yeah, the French generally they can just cut and left. Uh, in Australia, we all, almost always turn them. Yeah. Thank you. What a good start. Thirty seconds. You've done three. You're on. You're on track. Focus. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the phone there. A little bit more to the right. It's a top and one oyster. Any good one. Well, this is the one. Oh, no, it's going to break. Five, six, four, three, two, one. one. I didn't get there. Oh. <laughs>